forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance the exodus of my heart as you found me you freed me held back the water from my release oh Yahweh you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah a cloud by day is a sign that you are with me the fire by night is the guiding light to my feet as you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh Yahweh you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Good morning. Glad you're worshiping here with us this morning. As always, I've got some information for you. I think my ear is shrinking, by the way. This thing never fits right. Anyways, bulletin. You will find this on the end of your pews. This is kind of our weekly newsletter, if you would. Uh, a lot of information in there, what's happening here in our church, different ministries to be involved in. Uh, and just some good information. I encourage you to take this home, hang it on your fridge, read it over. We got prayer requests on the back uh, that we can all join together in prayer for. A couple of quick things I do want to highlight. The bus ministry has started again, and we are in need of drivers. If you'd like to drive to help pick people up to bring them to church, please sign up on the, the sheet this morning. Um, if you would like more information, still please put your name down. And uh, we will contact you to answer whatever questions you may have. Um, we can do training on that, so if you're just uncomfortable, come on out. We can show you what's going on, give you some test drives around the parking lot and things. Also, the Health and Safety Committee still has a sign-up sheet hanging on the board out there. That is supposed to be coming down today also. So if you'd like to participate in that group, please make sure to get your name on there so we can... Get a hold of you, link up, and make things happen. So yesterday, we had a work day. Now, if you read your bulletin and everything else, you knew about it, but I forgot to announce it last Sunday. So I'll take some of the, the blame. But we had still, I think, 10 or 11 people that came out and did work. So if you came out yesterday, I want to thank you for putting in some effort, digging a four-foot deep hole to get electric line and all sorts of other things. Uh, so when you're available, just think about joining us. The fellowship's good and the work gets done. I want you to take a look at the bottom of your bulletin. May is busy. We've got lots of good things going on. 
Uh, so please take a look at those, the different opportunities to be involved with your church family. Uh, we're going to do a cookout at the end of the month here on the church grounds. Uh, so if you don't have plans, I encourage you to make that your plan. And then as always, if you have any questions about church membership or baptism, we are available. Give us a call to church, stop by, we'll talk to you. We had our pizza with the pastor the other week, and we have had several verbal confirmations of people wanting to join our church. So within the next week or so, be ready to have some new members presented. It's going to be exciting times. And now, let's take a moment and greet each other. You can do that by waving. I know it's still pretty lame, but Scott, how you doing, buddy? Is Ella, there's Ella. It's Ella's birthday today, folks. Who's two? Kenzie? It's Kenzie's birthday, too. All right. All right, friends, let's pray together. Almighty Father, we praise your holy name and we thank you for the blessing and opportunity it is to come together with other believers, Lord. We thank you for giving us the freedom to assemble. We thank you for Jesus. We pray now this morning that you'd receive our praise and be glorified. We pray your spirit be present and help us in all things to pursue what you would have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. to sing of his love this morning, but before that, Psalm 28. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give him thanks to him in the singing. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Thanks be to God. Amen. Christ. 
This time I'd like to invite the children, if they'd like to head back to FBC Kids Church. If you're a visitor this morning, we do have a children's program up through fifth grade, led by our volunteers. Oh, it's a good looking group. You know, I'm just going to say it, I say it every week, it's a good looking group, right? But I'm going to remind all of you right now, those kids walking out of here are the future of this church. Those kids are the ones that Jesus died for, that they may grow up to lead the next generation to serve him. It's my prayer we never lose sight of that. An elderly woman had just returned to her home from an evening of religious service. For those of you who don't know, that's church. When she was startled by an intruder, as she caught the man in the act of robbing her home of its valuables, she yelled, Stop! Acts 2.38. That passage talks about repenting and turning from sin. The burglar stopped dead in his tracks. Then the woman calmly called the police and explained what she had done. As the officer cuffed the man to take him in, he asked the burglar, why did you just stand there? All the old lady did was yell a scripture at you. Scripture, replied the burglar. She said she had an ax in 238. Now this was a joke that I found on a Christian joke website that ties directly to how we've been talking about Scripture as the armor of God. It, <laughs> I just got the visualization of an old lady with an ax and two pistols. But that's exactly what it is. You know, we can joke and laugh because it's funny. But as we look at these armors for the past week, we looked at the first three pieces. And then now we're looking at the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. And it's my hope and prayer that you'll start to see these pieces as true gear, as real equipment for your spiritual walk. Let's pray together. Almighty Father, we thank you so much for the blessing it is to be together, to belong to a body of believers, a family that follows Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to be present today and for your word. We thank you for Jesus making it all possible for us to come to you. Prepare our hearts, Lord, that we may receive exactly what you have for us. And it's my prayer, Lord God, that you would speak through me that despite any uh, inadequacies I have, that your word would not be limited, that your message would be received. Receive our praise, Lord God, and be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I mentioned already kind of the reminder of this series, this is a pretty short series. We could go much deeper. I've been parts of places where each piece of armor was a full week service. But here we're kind of just looking at the function and role. It's important, I believe, that we see these armor as true pieces of armor. We looked at some funny clip art the first week of the kid stuff, how we teach children the armor of God. And then we kind of leave it there. And that's really unfortunate for the believer. We sang a song about the battle belonging to the Lord. Next week, we're going to look at what that really means. I've had people ask me, well, if the battle belongs to the Lord, why do we got to wear armor? Stay tuned. Next week, we'll talk about that. But before we get to next week, let's get to this week. We're going to be looking in Ephesians, same passage we've been working through. 
I'm going to read a little more this time than just the individual pieces of armor. We're going to read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Let us receive the word of our Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. As I read that, I hope you picked up a couple of different transitions in there. As we get to verse 16, where it talks about the shield of faith, the helmet, the sword of spirit, it says, in addition to all this, take up. That's a little different than the first part, right? The beginning, it talks about, just put it on, wear it. I want you to visualize that in your mind. You put on your clothes. Like you put on the armor, the pieces listed. And then you take up something. Right? Something in addition to what you're already wearing. So keep that in your mind as we, we move through this. Over the past few days, well, actually this past week, I have asked several people to kind of explain to me what their mind's eye saw as I mentioned the armor of God. Specifically, I asked what do you see when you close your eyes when I talk about the shield of faith as mentioned by Paul? Now the answers were surprisingly similar, yet different. So most responses described look like this. You kind of visualize a medieval knight, a shiny shield. I had one person tell me that they think of a shield like that that kind of, I don't want to say morphs into, but kind of acts as a force field. That when you put up your shield of faith, it encases you like a bubble. None of them are wrong. But that's not quite what Paul was trying to articulate. Okay? So while this is absolutely a shield and absolutely does the same type of thing of protecting the bearer, Paul was not trying to convince the people that this is what they should take up. Instead, as Paul was talking to the people about the shield of faith, this is what he had in mind. Let me see what I got back here real quick. You didn't know we had an armory in here. Me and the preschoolers made this. I did the tape and the cutting, and they did the decorating. So this is what Paul wanted people to visualize. All right? So the Greek word for shield is teros. I'm saying that wrong, but you get the understanding. All right? It's similar to a door. Now, the word door is actually with the Greek name. And the reason for such is because it looks like a door. It's big. When the Romans would bear this shield, check this out. You see that? Am I hidden? Pretty much, right? This protected the entirety of the soldier. In order for the enemy to get to the soldier, they had to go through the door. 
So when you would hear Paul talking about this, you would make that connection. You would go, oh, it really protects us. Right, this shield was about, this is about four feet tall by two, two and a half feet wide. And it is meant to not only fully protect the individual soldier, or in our case, believer, but it was also employed by the entire team, the entire group. So we have our faith, and we take up that shield, and we cling tightly to it, right? Scripture tells us what will happen. We will extinguish the flames. Now, shields do not have built-in fire extinguishers, do they? That would be awesome. Well, our shield does. All right? That's important understanding because a normal shield will just deflect. So Satan shoots his arrows, his attack. It hits the shield. A normal shield would deflect the attack. Well, if I'm standing next to my wife and I deflect the shield or the, the attack, it could hit her, right? Does that make sense? A ricochet, a deflection. Our shield does not do that. The shield we are given by God takes that attack and extinguishes it. It's no longer valid to hurt anyone. Get that? We're not just deflecting an attack. We are stopping it cold by our shield of faith. Satan shoots these darts or arrows, or some commentators call them missiles, in hopes of disrupting you, damaging you to the point you're incapable of helping others, helping yourself and pursuing Christ. But as we looked at last week, all these armor pieces tie back to Scripture, the Word of God. When we know the truth, we're able to hold our shield of faith in that truth. We're able to stand against the enemy. How many of you have ever been told when you're having a hard time, go to church, be amongst your church family. You just feel better. Why is that? Any guesses? So I sit here until I hear something? Because this is a place where believers are. This is our family. But I'm going to take it a step farther. There's spiritual warfare. It's a real attack. And when we're together... My dramatic pause didn't work because my clarity didn't go. When we're together, that's what it looks like. Can you guys make that out? There is a formation of soldiers with shields like this. And as you just saw, when it is bore by the soldier, they're pretty much covered up. In that formation, the first guy has his shield in front. The second guy has his shield on top. The third guy has his shield on the side. The entire unit is fully protected from attack. And then they advance. Visualize that. Visualize all of us together with our shields of faith marching towards the enemy. And as we come upon other believers who are out in this world waiting for that protection, looking for help, we pull them into our unit where our faith protects us. This is real stuff. It is not some fun thing to get kids to understand the spirits. This is life for the believer. When you neglect to take up your shield of faith, a gap forms in that formation. What was once a solid barrier allowing us to work together, to formulate, to move forward, now has a glaring hole in it where the enemy can hit. We 
you are important to this church family. The bigger picture is our church family is in that unit and we come together and we will eventually, with all other believers, as a church universal. And we will stand in the final battle together. Shield of faith, holding true when you stick to what you know as true. Next, we're going to move right into helmet of salvation. That's what it looks like for the Romans. So as I was prop hunting, I found one of these back in the storage way in the back. I went to put it on, my head was too fat, so you get no helmet demonstration today. But it was, it was silver like that, and it had a red broom on top. It was cool. But my melon did not allow it to stay on. So you're just going to have to visualize. That's what the Romans would think of. If you look, you see that kind of brim coming off the back? Well, that was functional. Okay? It didn't just look cool like a hat on backwards. That would help protect the neck from vertical strikes, from any of the arrows coming over. It was all functional. Cheeks and everything were protected, and they hung down kind of like jowls. But the primary protection was for what? The brain. The brain, the, the control center. I have shared several times, and I'm going to share it again, and I'll probably share it many more times. I personally hold this piece of armor near and dear. I have clung to the understanding that the helmet helps us keep our thoughts captives to God's word, his truth. Over the years, I have been hit with the arrows and the lies of, hey, you've sinned too much to follow Jesus. Why would God pick someone like you when he has all these precious, intelligent, whatever people? There's so many more better options out there than you. Why would he pick you? And there was a time in my life, very, very clearly, I'll just share it flat out. I stood in my bedroom and cried as a grown man. Just getting out of the Marine Corps, I'm pursuing Jesus Christ again. I've recommitted myself. I got back into studying his word, walking in his ways, and I stood in my room and cried because I got hit with an error that I wasn't prepared for. It was Satan saying, you are not who's God's calling. Maybe when you were younger, maybe when you were walking more in tune with him, but not now. You went in the Marine Corps. You were trained just to kill people. That was what your goal was. How could God use someone like you? And I stood there. And for probably three minutes, I fought with that lie. You know what happened? I prayed. I said, Jesus, I don't know what to do. And at that moment, I was reminded of the passage that he did not send Jesus in the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world may be saved. So if I've been forgiven, which I have, I am no longer under condemnation. In the moment his truth penetrated was my helmet going on, and I stood there and go, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be part of your mission and sharing your love with this world. And from that point on, I try daily. And I say try because sometimes I don't do it well. I try daily to keep my thoughts captive to God's word. There's times when I've made this reference before in traffic and I'm getting real angry at something. Like I reference this a lot. Why can't I turn right by McDonald's and CVS? 
every time I get there, I feel my neck get red. I'm like, I could have gone 15 times. You know, it, yeah. And I have to say, and my wife is going to remind me, maybe God's teaching you patience. And so even in those comments, that is the word of God coming over my head. It's like, okay, you're right. This is silly. I shouldn't be allowing this to make me upset. I got my helmet on. And I say, Lord God, thank you for teaching me patience. But this helmet is so much more than just the little things. When you do the little things, you will automatically make sure you're equipped for the big things. Tony Evans, he references or, or provides a description of the helmet like this. It protects the head, the mind, the control center of the body. Our spiritual standing in Christ must protect our thinking. If we don't know the truth, how can we believe his truth? If we don't believe his truth, how can we hold our thoughts captive to it? His truth needs to be believed, to be used. If I say, yeah, Jesus was not sent to condemn everybody, but to offer salvation, but I don't believe that, then I've never received salvation for it, right? Then it means nothing. They're words. If I put on a helmet that has to do with the salvation given by Jesus Christ, and I don't believe that truth, that helmet is made of Swiss cheese. Too often, as believers, we neglect that. Salvation is the greatest gift the ability to have relationship with our Lord God because of Jesus. And the helmet is called the helmet of salvation. That truth is what protects you. Stand in the truth of that salvation. Use that to keep your thoughts captive. Hey, is this something that glorifies God? Is this something that people would say, boy, he's different. He's, he's got something different. Should I be making incredibly awkward faces at a traffic light? Just saying. Again, this all ties back to God's word. It just does. We can stand here and say, I've got my armor on today. But if you don't believe the truth of the word or know what it says, you don't have your armor on today. Because it all hinges upon the word of God. We're going to see that a little better as we move into the next piece of armor. Before we get there, I'm going to make one more illustration or example about this helmet of salvation. What happens when you hold your thoughts on anger, on pain, suffering, fear? What happens? Satan slips in. You are no longer protected. No, I don't have the picture up anymore. I'm telling you, my ear's shrinking. Anyways, I don't have the picture up anymore, but you remember that, that tortoise formation they showed that basically exposed your ankles and your melon? Well, when you got your helmet on, you're protected there. You take that helmet off and you start thinking on things that are not the truth, you're vulnerable. When your mind's vulnerable, you start to not make the right decisions other places, and maybe you drop your shield a little bit to scratch your forehead. 
Then when you set your shield down, oh man, it's heavy. You lay it all the way down, you bend over, and now the guys behind you are vulnerable too. Each piece of this armor is vital to your spiritual walk and vital to the spiritual walk of the person sitting in the pews around you. Every Tuesday, we've got a prayer meeting. Right now, we're still only on Zoom, and we get together, and we pray. We share prayer requests, and we pray together. Usually, it's about 40, 45 minutes, but we've allocated up to an hour. And in my mind, when we get together during that prayer, we are strategizing and calling in for our air support from God in this battle. We are standing there saying, okay, our church family can't be here with us, Lord God. Take action, protect them. When we get together, help our formation be strong that we may all go out into this world and serve him. But if your thoughts are not captive to his word, you become a weak link, if you would. And we all have those moments. That's what I like to think is when we know someone's struggling, when you come to church and say, guys, I'm really having a hard time, we move you to the center of our formation, protect you, pray for you, and that you're secure while you're working through whatever challenges you're working through. Your church family's there. Keep your thoughts captive to the word of God. And now, we move into our offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I thought about trying to build a, uh, a holster for this. So I could stand up here like a, a Western movie and... Whew, Not that good of a craftsman, but you get the idea. This is our weapon. Not only is this our weapon, it is the base of all our defense. Every piece of armor that we have for protection is based in the truth of Jesus. And it's also the only tool we have to engage offensively. did this earlier with the shield. If I were to ask you, which I did, I asked some people, what you see when we talk about the sword of the spirit, what comes to your mind? It's usually the one on the right that people describe. Again, it's a uh, medieval knight sword. That thing's about four and a half feet long, and they, you know, just swing that thing around. Very little precision in that. That's like a, a weapon of mass destruction. But instead, what Paul was trying to get everyone to, to reference and look at were these little guys next to him. All right? The Greek word used in Scripture for this is the makara. All right? It means little sword or big knife. That's what that means. The Greek does have a word for a long sword, which is hamphara. Paul didn't use that word, all right? So the word Paul specifically chose was little sword or big knife. They rarely exceeded 19 inches. Let me go back to the armory real quick. I did find a prop here that'll work. My head had no bearing on it. This is bigger than the sword that Paul is referencing. All right? This is bigger. So when Paul's telling us to take up the sword of the Spirit, it's not a big giant thing where you can stay away from somebody. It's smaller than this. I want you to visualize something real quick. Okay? We're in battle. Look how far I can reach. You see this?
close quarters combat. The enemy will be in your face. It's not going to be a battle of distance. You're not going to be fighting a battle with someone you see coming. The enemy is going to be in your face, in your family, in your home, where you will have to engage close quarters combat. I've had a couple conversations lately about how believers, the church in general, sanitizes scripture, sanitizes Christianity. We want it to look pretty. We want the image to be appeasing. I'm guilty of it. Matter of fact, I think when I started this series, I talked to you about one of my favorite examples of utilizing the armor is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. I have visualized and told people, think of it like a, a jousting match. Not jousting, what did I say? Fencing. A fencing match where you got a couple of fancy folks in all white clothes and you're... I got no idea how they score those things, but that's what I had told people. Like, think about it, back and forth. When the actuality of it is, we're close and we're stabbing. We're right there. It's nasty. It's nasty. You're being attacked. Your spiritual life is being attacked, trying to take down the truth of what Jesus has given to you. And guess what? If he can't get to you because your shield is strong in front, he's going to go, okay. I see your wife over there struggling. To stand in defensive armor is not enough. We talked about the prayers back in January, prayers of intercession, standing in the gap for those we love, those who need the protection and, and saving grace of Jesus Christ. That's engaging in battle. I mentioned last week as we talked about the belt of truth, knowing God's word as the Logos, right? So if you know what scripture says, that's the Logos. The moment you employ it as a weapon with, with specific usage, it becomes rhema. Think about that temptation again. Satan says, throw yourself off this cliff. Because the Bible says that God will not let anyone or let you stumble your toe. He'll send angels to protect you so you don't trip, right? So do it. God will save you. And Jesus goes, stab. The Bible also says, do not test the Lord your God. That attack's foiled. And he took a hit. Satan's like, man, oh, yeah. Oh, you got to be hungry. Command these stones to turn to bread. Jesus says, Gah. The Bible also says, God will take care of you, right? Not just bread. Every word that comes is the word of life, bread of life. Jesus was in a close quarters combat during that temptation. Okay? He was not standing there fencing, poking, ding, ding, ding. He was in it. 40 days. Tired, hungry, knowing what's going on. And he's in a battle. He knew the word. He knew the Logos. So he was able to employ the rhema. Can you do that? Can you do that today in the ways that this world presents different lies? Can you stand there and poke holes in the enemy? If this world comes to you, if someone, your neighbor comes up to you and goes, Jesus was just a really good prophet. What's your response? I want you to think about that. What's your response? There's a group of people who come to your door potentially and say, boy, Jesus was such a great prophet. And you as a follower of Jesus, what is your response? Is it, yeah, he was. Boy, I sure hope not.
you should be able to pull something from Scripture, some passage to say, he is God in the flesh. This is the Son of God. Fully man, fully divine. And if you don't have one passage to combat something like that, I pray now that you would try and work on it. Because that's what it means to employ the sword of the Spirit. To be able to yield the truth in opposition. It's not always going to be something blatant. It's not always going to be someone saying something along the lines of uh, abortion is better than adoption. Okay, That's an easy lie that we can say, you're an idiot. Okay, It's not always going to be as clear cut as something like that. It's going to be someone gives you a shred of truth. You have to know the Logos so you can employ the Rhema. So you can turn that belt of truth and whip out the sword of the Spirit and get after it. We're all already equipped. We've got this stuff. We've got it. God's given it to us. I had a whole nother piece that we could go into, but we're not going to because I, I talked too long. But I want to give you one last example of what it means for the rhema. Utilizing it as a sword, the word of God. I've had people bring up my past many times. And I'm just going to clarify, I feel like I paint a really dark picture of who I was. In comparison to Christ, it's pitch black. But it's not like I was a drug dealer or a murderer or anything like that, okay? So let me just throw that out there. But I've had people say, boy, you used to be violent or angry or selfish. You, you can't be forgiven that easy. And now I can sit there and go, yes, I can. That does nothing. Or I can say, you know what, I can understand how you feel like that. But in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, I just took the truth of God's word and directly addressed a lie of Satan. Not only am I advancing forward, I am helping that person see past the lie. We are all called to do that. There will be so many opportunities, but many times we miss them. God has chosen to give us life through Christ. And with that comes responsibility. Put on the full armor of God that you may stand strong, stand firm. Most of you have already come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And for you, I'd encourage you Every day, be intentional about suiting up your armor, standing firm in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, ready to engage in whatever battle comes to you. But some of you may not know that truth yet, may not have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior yet. To you, I say, why not? If you've got the Holy Spirit pulling on your heart, you feel that call, that desire, that craving for more to have that relationship, that's what it is. Nothing will fill that. It's Jesus Christ. All you need to do is acknowledge that. Repent. Acknowledge, hey, Lord God, I'm sorry. I've been living separate from you. Jesus, I need you to forgive me and bring me into relationship. He will. You can do that right where you sit. You can do it in your mind. You can do it out loud. You can come up here and pray with me. You can find any person in this place and pray together. 
It is you and God who are having that conversation. Don't wait. Today is your last today. It just is. You'll never get yesterday back, and tomorrow's never guaranteed. Christ died for you. If you're already serving him, continue to do so faithfully. If you have not yet made that commitment, why not? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word, for the salvation you've given through your son, for the equipment you've given us to stand in the battle, to help protect those who are serving you as well, Lord God, that you've given us the ability to cry out to you. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. None of this matters apart from him. I pray that you would lead each one of us today with the truth that you've given us, that we may take action as we leave here, that we may contemplate ways to serve you better, to stand armored up and ready to go. Receive our praise, Lord God, and be glorified. We thank you so much for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. and the soldiers of Christ arise. Soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on. Be strong in all your God provides through his eternal son, the power set upon, far stronger far than you, but boldly trust in Jesus Christ and prove what he can do. big shield of faith and wield his spirit sword for when he speaks a world obey their holy sovereign lord we stand secure in christ and all that he Last week we sang the Victor's Crown in the choir, and I feel like that's just such a great song to walk out to as you remember and that God fights for you. You are always fighting for us, heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. 
You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your great name, in your name I will bow down. In your presence, fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple, let your power overflow. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. Don't forget that. He's already got the victor's crown. We're just enduring the battle. All right? Do not forget we serve the victor. Battle's won. We're just enduring it. Okay? Jesus Christ has won. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you that you have won, that you wear the victor's crown that we are merely enduring the battle until you say it's time. Lead us, Lord God, as we walk out into this life, into our areas of influence. Be the power that flows through us in your love that people may look and say, I want that. 
Thank you, Lord God, for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.